there's a question that I'm sometimes asked. It often comes out as, do Christians meditate? But I think the real question that people are trying to ask is, when Christians practice meditation, is there something distinctively Christian they're doing, or do they just borrow Buddhist practices? Today I want to talk about meditation and contemplative practices within Christianity and provide some history and context. While I do that, I invite you to, uh, you know, subscribe to this channel, to click the bell so that you're notified of future videos, and to, to really join me in thinking about this topic. So meditation, meditative practices, really go back to the beginning of Christianity and, and predate Christianity. We know that within Judaism, there were monastic movements, the Essenes and others, and among their practices was the observance of silence. We know that Jesus himself would take time alone to be silent, to be off without others. He began his ministry spending 40 days in the desert, we're told, and there are often references in, in the Gospels to Jesus going off alone by himself, wanting to get away, to be alone, and to pray. Those are all indicators of meditation and a contemplative life. But where we really see the distinctly Christian development happen around meditative practices comes in the fourth century. And what really kicks that process off happened in 313, when Constantine declared that Christianity would be the official religion of the Roman Empire. Lots of people didn't like, you know, integrating church and state. You know, it's still a problem today. The response to that by ordinary people and some very learned people, by priests and bishops, was to leave the Roman Empire. They picked up and moved. Men moved, women moved. They went to the British Isles. They went to the Northern European area outside of the Roman Empire. And they went in particular to the Sinai Desert, to Egypt. It's Egypt that where we have most of the records. And I presume that moving to some of those other areas, they were people were moving into areas that weren't as friendly, that, that, that tribal groups didn't really want people from the Roman Empire, as well as parchments and things from that era probably wouldn't have survived very well in those climates. But some of that's just speculation on my part. What we know from the movement into the Sinai Desert was that a very distinctive form of Christian meditative practice developed. As a whole, it's referred to today as hesychastic spirituality. Hesychastic spirituality, it's named after the Greek god Hezekiah. Hezekiah was the god of quiet. In hesychastic spirituality, the focus is to remember that each of us is made in the image and likeness of God, that there is a divine essence, a divine image, a divine reflection in each of us, and that our spiritual growth and our life process is all about experiencing the divine within us. It's about learning to live in union with that divine image and doing that by letting go of everything that separates us from that divine image. So it's sort of like the process of peeling back an onion layer by layer. And that process happens through a journey of healing to come to wholeness. And it happens mostly in silence, in silent practice. And so these people would move into the desert and begin practicing this silence. And there were men and there were women and they would group together. They would form small communities. There were no churches. And there were the beginnings, the fledglings of monasteries at that time. So that's where the monastic movement within Christianity originates. I think there's one very important figure from that time period that will really help us understand the development of spiritual thought within Christianity. And that's John Cashin. 
Now, Cashin, I think, should be the patron saint for spiritual seekers. Cashin wanted to get it right. Cashin wanted to understand what it meant to lead a perfect spiritual life. He was a monk, and so he was trying to understand what it meant to be a perfect monk, a perfect Christian, a perfect spiritual person, to really embrace this hesychastic tradition fully. So Cashin left his own monastery and went through the desert looking for the teachers who had great reputations in that era. And he would meet them and spend time with them, months at a time, and talk with them and learn from them. And we have his recorded conversations with these great teachers in two books that he wrote. What Cashin found sort of was a sense of disappointment because he didn't find that perfection. What he found was some nuance from one teacher to another. But he took everything that he learned and eventually left Egypt and moved back into the Roman Empire and made his way to Gaul, what we now refer to as France. And it was there that he established his own monastery. And that monastery continued for 1400 years. It was from that monastery that those teachings about hesychastic spirituality began to infiltrate through Western Europe. They influenced heavily what developed in the British Isles, which became known as English, English mysticism. For instance, the text, The Cloud of Unknowing, that has an unknown author, was heavily, heavily reflective of Cashin's teachings. And, the, and the, the, the visions of both Julian of Norwich and the writings of Marguerite, Marjorie Kemp all reflect what Cashin talked about. But it wasn't just in the British Isles. His influence expanded north and was influential with Hildegard of Bingen as well as Meister Eckhart. So we see that, that this movement happened from Egypt up through the rest of Europe, and Cashin was largely responsible for it. And it was because he was looking for perfection that he collected so much wealth that he was able to share with others. Over time, other forms of contemplative practice emerged different ways of doing meditation. You know, within Christian contemplative practice, there are many things besides meditation. There's, there's walking meditation. There's Lexio Divina, spiritual reading, which I talk about in another video. But there's also what's called discursive meditation. You may have heard of the Jesuits and Ignatius of Loyola. Their form of prayer is a discursive meditation. It's, it's more similar to what we would call guided meditation today. Ignatius encouraged people to take stories from scripture and images from scripture and imagine what it would be like to be there, to imagine being the characters in the story, to immerse oneself and to think through what that experience was. And based on sitting with that inner dialogue, to allow that inner dialogue to transform them. There's also people like Teresa of Avila who didn't really have a method. Her method was very simple, to just sit. And it was simply by sitting in quiet, being in that silence, that she began to explore what union and communion with the divine was really about for her. And, and we read about that in her book, The Interior Castle. So within Christianity, there is a great deal of spiritual wealth related to contemplative practices and meditation in particular. Now, for your spiritual journey, I think it's important to really work with what's helpful for you. And whether those techniques come from Christianity or Buddhism or Hinduism or, or some other tradition, it's really your spiritual journey. Cashin made the mistake of thinking that there was some perfect way of doing it all, but there isn't. There is the, way, the path that is right for you, 
the path that is right for bringing you to wholeness in life. And within the Christian context, the path that is right to enable you to encounter that divine image deep within you. Be sure to subscribe to this channel, like the video, share it with others, because this is really stuff people don't know, so share it. And leave me some comments and tell me what you'd like to know more about or things that I could go into more deeply. And most especially know that I really appreciate that you take time to be with me here on Spirituality Beyond Borders. Have a really great day.